Christine, what's all this? Oh, it's our new research department. Don't you remember we said we were going to add research to our list of math shop services? Well, I got very excited and went out and bought all this lab equipment. And you've started doing some research? Not really. Want some coffee? Uh, no, thanks. You know, we really don't need all this stuff. Stuff? This is not just stuff, Kenwall. Besides, my research does not stop here. And what else have you done? Well, I have reprogrammed Euclid to handle a wide variety of data analysis and to uh, test our hypothesis. Whoa, well, well, wait a minute. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's explain what we've planned for today first. Oh, my pleasure. Hi, welcome to the math shop where we dig deep, really deep, to get you all the data you can handle. I'm Christine, and this is my math shop partner and math master, Canwall. Hello. And this here is my sophisticated and homemade computer, Euclid. Our topic today is data analysis, the world of research. Most of us encounter research through the mass media, television, radio, or the newspaper. Whether it's the latest findings on the risks of smoking or another economic forecast, or those election predictions that come out, you know, one minute after the polls close, they all involve data analysis. Not all research data is accurate, however. For example, neither Canwall nor I are over six feet tall. So, based on a survey of math shop employees, we could say that all mathematicians are under six feet. That's a bad use of statistics. It's inaccurate and misleading. But statistics are not inherently bad. If statistical data is collected and analyzed carefully and reported in an unbiased way, it can be a helpful tool in decision making. So it's important to critically assess statistical data, just like it's important to be critical of the news you read. Today, Christine and I will explain how to conduct some simple research using a six-step approach. Let's start with the basics. Statistics are usually categorized into two groups, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Euclid, can you give us an example, please? Descriptive statistics are numerical facts about a particular class of objects or people. For example, this graph compares the populations of five countries. Here, the statistical data is reported in a graphic way, and it helps us to visualize the relative sizes of populations. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, are used to infer or derive logical conclusions about a large population. This is done by studying a smaller representative group. Here's a simple example. If I try lighting five matches from this box and find that all five won't light, I'm likely to infer that there is something wrong with all of the matches in the box, or at least most of them. You're probably familiar with popularity polls that dominate the news during elections. These polls generate inferential statistics. Euclid? Suppose that there were an election in the fictional riding of a um, math shop, Little Mountain. Someone does a poll of 250 people to find out their preferred political party. And from that poll, they try to predict how the vote will go across the country come election day. In this graph, every X represents 10 voters. Judging from these results, no party represents a clear choice by the voters. But before we can substantiate that claim, we'll have to analyze the data in more detail. Right now, this graph is descriptive, but not inferential. That's right. Now, the point is, if you do it right, you can predict the behavior of millions by studying, let's say, 2,000 people. So, to show you what we mean, today on Math Shop, I'm going to conduct a simple research study right here before your very eyes. Ooh. What do you have in mind? Well, I'm going to study the effects of ultraviolet rays on the growth rate of dictostelium discordium. What does that mean exactly? Oh, well, <clears throat> I'm uh, going to shine some UV light on this... Uh, your slime mold. I'll get it. Hi, Math Shop. Christine speaking. Hey, Tibor. How are you? Good. While Christine takes that call, I'll go over some of the basics of any research. The key is do it right. How you conduct research directly affects the validity of your findings. Good. There are six basic steps in the research process. Okay. Maybe you could list them for us, Euclid. They are identify the research problem, design your research question, choose a sampling method, collect the data, analyze it, 
and then report your findings. Okay. That's Let's fine. look at the first step. What's wrong, Christine? Well, this is depressing. We got our first research customer. Well, that's how commerce works. You advertise and you get customers. Yeah, wait till you hear what it is, okay? Okay, let's hear it. Okay, I have this cousin, Tibor. Tibor, yeah. you know, your family tree needs some pruning. Oh, listen, buddy, if it wasn't for my family, we'd be pushing protractors on the shopping channel. Okay, okay, tell me about Tibor. I'm sorry, I'm sensitive. Okay. Well, Tibor has this business that provides housekeeping to large corporations in the area. I see. Anyway, and what they have to do is they have to put fresh rolls of toilet paper into the washrooms. Toilet paper? Yeah. And he's been getting complaints about the way he's installing them. So he's been telling his employers to put it in the other way. And now he's getting complaints about that. I don't understand. What do you mean by the other way? Well, okay. Let me show you. If the roll was hanging here like this, mm -hmm. which way should it hang? With the roll over like this or with it under against the wall like this? I see. That's the research. Tibor wants us to investigate which people prefer. So let's get him an answer. No ifs, ands, or buts. Oh. <laughs> Woo. Woo, that's good. That's rich. Look, that's the kind of humor I totally wanted to avoid, okay? That's why I didn't want to take the job in the first place. I want to stick to slime molds. Okay, okay, sorry. This fits in within our program, so let's just do it. All right, on one condition. No more toilet humor, okay? Okay, okay, this is serious business. Yeah. All right, Ken, well, let's do the first step. Okay. The first step in any research is to identify the problem. If you know what you want to find out, the next steps come easily. That's right. Well, this is pretty simple. Okay. We want to determine which installation most people prefer. Okay. Here we go. These are our walls. Our little toilet paper holders. Nice big fresh rolls of toilet paper. I don't want to have any anxiety at all. Okay. Now, do people like to have the roll rolling up like this or down like this. Hmm? What's wrong? You're using my whiteboard, you know. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was so precious to you. Okay, now for the second step. The second step is to design your research. Great. Now, if I was going to work with slime mold, that would mean designing an experiment, but since I'm researching people's opinions, it must mean designing my survey question. I want the question to be clearly stated, and it can't show any bias for one particular response. Here's one way we could put the question. Euclid, type, please. When you install toilet paper in your washroom, do you do so such that the paper rolls up or down? Stop typing. There. Once you have a question, you should ask yourself, what sort of responses you might get? Yeah. Well, how would you respond? Or you could check it out with a few friends. Is that, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? What do you mean by down? The paper would definitely have to roll down from the top. That's so you can whack it, count the number of panels as they go by, and then stop it when you have the correct number. Well, I know I shouldn't admit this, but uh, certainly not politically correct, but uh, hey, I don't change the paper in my house. Some, somebody else does it. Oh, our toilet paper is stored on top of the toilet under one of those cute little knitted doggies. Or is it crocheted? I'm sure you've seen them. Ours is a little white poodle and it's so cute. What do you mean by up? Well, it rolls up. You know, when you pull on it, it rolls. Well, unless you're talking about the back, you know, the back closest to the wall. When you pull on the front, and pull that part down, and it rolls, the back rolls up, you know, unless you're pulling from the bottom, but it, you know, if you look at a cross section, the back rolls up. Slime molds are starting to look question? better all the time. Don't worry. Your trial gave us a lot of helpful information. One problem is obvious. You were asking people how they install the paper. Tibor's clients don't do that. He wants to know what their preference is. Right. And I could clarify the question. Okay, well, how about this? You could type, 
Which one of the following do you prefer? Toilet paper that dispenses over the roll, like a waterfall, or toilet paper that dispenses under the roll? Stop typing. That's better. And I can give them the choice of three possible replies. Over, under, or no preference for those who don't care, or have those you know, little knitted doggy cover things that... Anyway, if I decide to collect data using a printed survey, I could add a diagram, but that's a decision we can make later on. Okay, I'm gonna work with Euclid now to design a tally sheet. Maybe you could go on to the next step. All right, once you're satisfied, you have a clear question that will elicit good data, you're ready for step three, choosing a sampling method. There are a number of sampling techniques available. We'll talk briefly about three of them. The first is called a convenient sample. For example, Christine could run out on the corner and ask the survey question of people walking by. The only good thing about this approach is that it is convenient, but it's hardly random and it won't be representative of the larger group we are interested in because it only accounts for people in our immediate neighborhood. T-Bar's company serves a much wider population. Christine could try something else, though. It's called systematic sampling. In this situation, she would compile a list of everyone in the target population and then randomly order them. She could then take every tenth name on the list until she had enough for her sample. Whoa! That won't work. Our target population is too huge. It's, it's everyone in the city who uses the washrooms at T-Bar's services. Right, the list would be impossible to compile. For our purposes, the third method is the best. It's called simple random sampling. And what we're going to need is a list of random numbers and the local phone book. Christine, can you get Euclid to give us a list of random numbers? No problem. Euclid, random number chart, please. There you go. Thanks. We're going to use this chart to select participants for our research. We can start with any number in the list. In this case, each random number has six digits. Let me select one at random to help demonstrate. Here, 189205. So let me write this down. 189205. If you let the first three numbers represent the page number in the phone book, in this case, page 189. So let me use my phone book, open it to page 189. There it is. The fourth number represents the column, which in this case is the second column. And the last two numbers represent the fifth telephone number in the second column. That would be the first person we call. I've got my tally sheet ready. Oh, good. So I randomly select telephone numbers until I have all the respondents we need. By the way, how many do we need? Well, to save your cousin some money, we won't survey thousands of people. Generally, to have a reliable and representative sample, the sample size should be 100 or greater. As the sample size increases, the findings are more reliable. In other words, our confidence in the accuracy of the results increases as the sample size gets bigger. For the time being, let's set the size of the sample at 150. Okay, but let's get back to my first question about collecting the data. Now, should I use a form and a diagram, or should I use some other sort of format? The best results come from surveys that are anonymous. You know, people are likely to be more truthful. And written responses give you a record of the results and tend to be more accurate. Lastly, the survey should be as short as possible. People rarely have the time to answer a lot of questions. Well. No problem. We only have one question on our survey anyway. But, Canwell, I don't have time to put out a bunch of written surveys. Tibor wants the report done today. Today? Demanding, isn't he? Okay, here's what I recommend. It's a compromise, but it'll still provide us with some worthwhile data. We'll use a simple random sampling method using Euclid and his telephone database, collect data on 150 people, and do it over the phone. Okay, and I'd like to add two more questions to the survey. What's your age and what's your gender? Good idea. That's called demographic data. And it'll help you give Tibor a more informative report. Great. I'll get on the phone. Oh, uh, what if no one answers? Uh, if you have the time, it would be best to call them back. But to meet Tibor's deadline, keep calling random numbers until you have 150 respondents. Oh, and try not to influence anyone's answers. Hey! 
Hey, I got a life, you know. What do I care how people install their toilet paper? Besides, everyone knows it should be under anyway. Unbiased, Christine, unbiased. Okay, okay. When Christine finishes collecting the data, Hello. we'll need to this analyze it. And here's where the math comes in. I think you'll find it easy to do. When you see research findings published in the paper, especially opinion polls like ours, they are usually accompanied by two other statistics. One is called the confidence interval, and the other is called the range. In any sample, you can be sure there is going to be some error. Hello, this is the Matt confidence Johnson. interval, sometimes abbreviated as CI, is a way of indicating how much sampling error there is. It is expressed as a percentage. Confidence intervals are decided on before you start your research, and are usually set at either 90 or 95%. For example, if we decide on a 95% confidence interval, then we know that our poll will be accurate 95% of the time, or 19 times out of 20. Choosing a 90% CI provides a less rigorous test of your results, meaning you're willing to accept a greater chance of error. So CI is equal to 90%. In other words, 18 times out of 20, or 9 times out of 10. In the case of the toilet paper research, we're confident that the true result of the survey will be accurate 19 times out of 20, a 95% CI. Now, the range, our second statistic, is fairly easy to calculate. When the confidence interval is set at 95%, and only when it's set at 95%, you can use this formula. 100 divided by the square root of n, where n is the size of the sample. So this is 100 divided by, our sample size is 150, square root of 150, which is 100 divided by the square root of 150, 12.25, and this is equal to 8.16. So our confidence interval range is plus or minus 8.16%. We know that our result will fall somewhere between 0 and 100%. So let me show you visually. So it's between 0 and 100. We're not sure where our result will be yet. So let's mark it here just for demonstration purposes. So this is where our result is. Now, it will be some percentage. Because of the sampling error, which exists in all samples, we can't be 100% sure that the result falls exactly here. But we can be sure 95% of the time that the result will fall within a range. If we add 8.16% here and subtract 8.16% here, we can define the range within which our result will fall 95% of the time, or 19 times out of 20. Ken Wall, I got this guy on the phone who has three bathrooms in his house. One he doesn't use because it's in his mother-in-law's suite. The other one has a roll on the wall. And the third one has one of those little, you know, the knitted things. Oh, really? <laughs> what kind? Like a southern bell one, you know, with a big hoop. What do you mean, what kind? It doesn't matter what kind okay, he's got. just record the bathroom with a roll in it. Oh, okay. Hi, sir. Yes. No, for, forget about the knitted thing. Right. No, let's just focus on the one in the ensuite with the roll on the wall. Oh, it's over. Okay, figures he's one of these over guys. Unbiased, remember? Unbiased. Ooh. I'm going to do an example while Christine works on her data collection. Okay, Euclid, I need the information. It's an opinion poll like ours this time about the Olympic Games. A survey of 120 people indicated that 67% of the respondents preferred to watch the four-man bobsled rather than the two-man event. Here's how the results were calculated. First, a confidence interval of 95% was chosen. So CI is equal to 95%. Next, the range was calculated using a formula for a confidence interval of 95%. 100 
divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size. So I have 100 divided by our sample size of 120, which is equal to 100 divided by 10.95, which is equal to 9.13. So our range is plus or minus 9.13%. If I subtract or add this value to the finding of 67%, the range becomes 67 minus 9.13, which is 57.87% to 67 plus 9.13, which is 76.13%. Now, these can be rounded off to the nearest whole number. So this is 58%, and this is 76%. So let's show this visually. Our result is 67%, and we can place it about here. The range extends from 58 to 76. So you can phrase this result in two ways. Euclid type. With a confidence level of 95%, we can say that 58 to 76% of all people who watch the bobsled races prefer the four-man event. In other words, this finding will be accurate 19 times out of 20. This is the way we would phrase it using abbreviated notation. 67% plus or minus 9.13 at a confidence interval of 95%. So at CI of 95%. That's it. Now, let's move on to Christine's data. No. No, sir. <laughs> I'm not selling toilet paper. No, I would just like to know which you prefer. No, no, not the brand you buy. N no, like a, like a waterfall or... He hung up. So how's the data collection going? It's going. I have no opinion. I'm unbiased, remember? So far, I've collected research on 25 people. Good. You're phrasing the question the same way every time? You betcha. You know, that last caller sounded like a problem. Have you had many of those? A few. Some people don't understand what I want, although <laughs> I don't know why. Others have just hung up on me, and some have been very rude. And what have you done with those? Well, I haven't recorded them in my findings. Good. Such responses should not be recorded as no preference. They are non-responses and don't fit into the research design. Carry on. Yes, sir. Hello, this is the math shop calling. Do you have a few moments? Great. Could you just walk into your washroom for me? No, really, really, really don't worry. No, it's totally anonymous. OK. I promise you, your mother will never find out. Under. Great. Thanks. Bye. There. Finally done. The results are all in Euclid. Can you explain what you've done? Euclid tally sheet, please. I recorded their preference in the first three columns, either over, under, or no preference. I also recorded whether they were male or female. And lastly, I classified them based on age range. Great. Then Euclid added up the number of responses in all three columns and then calculated the percentage of total sample. And? And Euclid show results, please. Oh, there seems to be a clear preference for over. Yeah, can you believe it? How can people be like that? A, a little surprised, are we? Mm -hmm. Now on to the final step, writing a report. Let's focus on the percentage that prefer over. That's 58%. If we write the findings in the short form, we get 58% plus or minus 8.16 at a confidence interval of 95%. Euclid, what's the range then? OK, round off. I think Tibor would like a graph. Euclid, circle or pie graph, please. That looks great. Mm, I can also do a bar graph. Euclid, bar graph, please. That looks good, but I like the circle graph better. Yeah, me too. I'll give Tibor a call and let him know what we found. And Euclid can fax him a detailed report. Speed dial.
Hi, Tibor. Yes, well, I have your answer for you. According to our survey, 58% of the population prefer their toilet paper roll to go over. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's boggling, isn't it? I mean, our whole family are unders. Well, listen, you know, in fact, there is a large percentage of the population that had no preference. 24%, can you believe it? So, by installing the toilet paper roll over, you satisfy 58 plus 24, or 82% of the population. How accurate? Well, we're 95% confident that between 50 and 66% of the population prefer over. Mm -hmm. No problem. No, it was fascinating, really. Anyway, you're welcome. Yep, I'll fax you a copy. Bye-bye. You know, I got a lot more out of that survey than you know. Like what? Euclid, bring up supplementary table one. According to our math shop research, it appears that young people don't have a strong preference regarding the installation of toilet paper. But preference gets stronger as we age. Collecting demographic data allows you to extend your findings. But until we calculate the confidence interval for each of these findings, they are only descriptive statistics, not inferential. I'll include them in my report as descriptive statistics and warn Tibor that the data wasn't fully analyzed. Good, they are interesting, though. Did you see any differences between male and female? Yeah. You could bring up a uh, gender preference table, please. There. It seems that females are more sure of their preferences. Hmm, I wonder why. Hmm, could it be maybe because females change the toilet paper more often? Well, I don't know. I think we should research that question. Hmm, oh yeah. Hey, you know what? We never put down our preferences. I think I'm going to go to the washroom and just check to see what it is. Christine, I'll be right that's back. that's got nothing to do with our show. It's got nothing to do with our show. It'll buy us our results. Um, join us again next time here on Math Shop. It well, hello, Canwall. It's what mine. I it's not mine. It's mine. It's not mine. Well, that's no, a total contradiction. Look what I, I didn't take you for the little knitted kind. Well, my neighbor gave it to me last week, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings, so I put it in the toilet. In the toilet? Yeah. Well, he didn't like that very much, did he? What is it? I don't know. I, I think it's Humpty Dumpty. It's also a mutated Humpty Dumpty. It looks like an octopus with only half the legs and a knitted cat. What could...